ServiceNow Knowledge Sport Team is sponsored by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're back live at ServiceNow Knowledge 14. We're here at Moscone South. Come on in and see us. Come in the uh, Moscone South, look right. We're right there, great setup that ServiceNow has provided for us. Uh, check out crowdchat.net slash no14. That's the, our crowd chat that's going on today. Crowd chat's great engagement app. All kinds of Twitter action going on. Doug Leone is here. He's a partner at Sequoia Capital, a Cube alum. Doug, we met last year out in Vegas. Great to see you again. Likewise. So great action going on with ServiceNow. Um, we've just been thrilled to, to be part of uh, following the, the, the trends. Been a really interesting year. Um, stock way up, pull back a little bit. Great buying opportunity for, for some folks that I think people are excited about. But you got to be thrilled uh, being here from the from day zero. Well, it's just wonderful to see so many customers being so enthused of uh, what ServiceNow has built over the years. It's just great to see a conference like this grow from a handful of customers to thousands of customers being here. When you're um, investing in a company, one of the things you, you presumably look for is for big markets, right? But there's been a lot of discussion about the size of the potential market for ServiceNow. You remember when they were doing the IPO, Frank talks about this all the time, they were talking about a $1.5 billion market, and now, I mean, I've sized the, the TAM at you know, many, many tens of billions, maybe 30 billion plus. Um, did you, was it just a gut feel that you had the sense that the market was big? Uh, did you just, did you not know? I mean, what, take us back to the early days. What we knew is that we had a very special founder in Fred Luddy, who when he came to Sequoia, instead of selling us about our, all the great things he did, he instead told us all the things he screwed up. And uh, he had the reverse approach. But we knew he was a clear thinker, had built a great product, and had a vision for the future. And when we see a founder who can articulate very clearly a vision, we know that if you articulate something clearly, that you think very clearly, he had lots of customers, he had momentum, and that caused us to make an investment with relative ease. Yeah, so, um, and we've seen that, that investment evolve into something that, I mean, I just don't know anybody who really, really predicted this, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of other trends that you're seeing in the business. Frank talks about cloudification. You know, what are some of the rip currents that, that you're watching? Lots of trends in the business. First and foremost, it's the arms race and security. Uh, that's always an evolving topic, and as we implement a new solution, the bad guys are implementing a new attack. So that's a trend that's probably never going to end. A second trend is the move to SaaS, which we all know of. It's the early innings. If you look at the total SaaS revenues, maybe it's 100 billion. If you look at the overall revenue in the software industry, it's probably closer to 900 billion. We actually think it's got a long way to go. And any CIO that thinks their financials are not going to be running in a Workday type solution or one of its competitors, SaaS competitors, five, seven years from now, is just incorrect. So we actually think that most software systems are not, if not all software systems, are going to SaaS. And then, and then another trend, a new trend, is IoT, Internet of Things. We have created in the last 12 months as much data in the globe as we have for all the years mankind has existed. And I think that pretty soon, whether it's all the items in your home, all the items in your companies are going to be tracked, they're going to communicate with one another, and that opens up a whole new market for big data and a new set of analytics companies. Yeah, you got the Internet of Things now on billboards coming out of, you know, San, coming into San Francisco, so it's almost going mainstream. And they're related, too, or you think about the security arms race and the potential damage that can be done on the Internet of Things. Uh, you know, it takes you back to Stuxnet, um, and you start to think about securing that infrastructure. Those are, those are high stakes games. Is, in your opinion, is security as a result of IoT? Is it a, is it a do over, or is it just sort of this evolutionary, you know, incremental investment? No, it's an incremental investment where I think we have to assume that the bad guys have entered our network. And the next question is, what do we do about it? We, we went from blacklisting to whitelisting, from signature based security to a new generation of routers to advanced threat boxes. But at the end of the day, we tend to believe at Sequoia that unless you encrypt everything, and then the next question is, which encryptum algorithm are you going to use? Because I don't think anybody's trusting the algorithms that are available right now. <laughs> and all the 
key data management issues associated with that. I just think it's an arms race, one step in front of the other, and it's going to go on for a long time. I want to ask you about uh, AWS. You talk about disruption. You must love disruption in your business. But uh, here you have this $3 billion plus entity growing at 60, 70% a year. I, I can't think of another example of a company that's sort of the gorilla uh, and also the fastest you know, mover. But they seem to have such an enormous lead. Uh, but one would think that that lead is, is maybe not sustainable. In other words, there will be other competition. Uh, do you buy that premise? Yes, uh, I mean, absolutely. And, and one of the reasons is that no one wants lock in to AWS. So large corporations have a vested interest in making sure there are competitors to AWS. It's tough to discount what Google has. I think you want to keep your eyes on, on, on AT&T and others, and also Microsoft. So I actually don't think it's a one horse race, if only because it's the vested interest of corporations to make sure it's not a one horse race. Well, and the economics too, right? I mean, a lot of times, I mean, we've seen Despite lock-in, you know, people have seen the ascendancy of Oracle, right? They gobbled up all the software companies. But the, it just seems the economics of, of, of cloud, even though they're, they're very attractive, right? You're seeing online service economics you know, look like software economics. But hardware economics, the, the, the marginal cost of hardware will never go to zero. So uh, you, would, you would expect that uh, from an economic standpoint, you'll see competitors, you mentioned Google, Microsoft, kind of interesting, what's going on with Nadella, you know, bringing those guys into the cloud. What's your take on Microsoft? Uh, well, I think Microsoft has great cash flows and I think they have to do something quite drastic. They brought in someone from the inside, I hope he's a talented executive and I hope he has a mindset to go acquire and do something different. I actually think the opportunity for Microsoft is to own the enterprise. And they should take, in my opinion, some drastic type steps and go acquiring some key assets to move them up the stack, maybe up the SaaS stack, and really own the enterprise. Yeah, go hard after it, interesting. Um, I wonder if you could talk about how Sequoia has changed uh, over the last you know, several years. How are you guys evolving, um, you know, reacting to the market changes? Uh, we have changed in subtle ways. We asked ourselves the one question, seven, eight years ago, or where do we think the most valuable companies in the globe are going to be built? And it was no longer clear that those companies would come out of the US or Silicon Valley. So we expanded into India and China. And right now, we have a big operation in China. We, we have had 24 initial public offering where investors are some of the largest companies. Also, as the world has gotten more and more flat, lots of our companies in the US are very interested in figuring out on how to go to India, where we see the largest growth in the mobile tech population around the, the globe, or in China, which heretofore has been very tough to penetrate. And in companies like LinkedIn, we've done a subsidiary where Sequoia Capital is an investor, along with LinkedIn, in a China sub, to help LinkedIn go into China. So we think that the world for the first time, maybe, it's really, really flat. Nothing in Ukraine? Not yet. <laughs> okay, we'll let things stabilize there. But we've heard a lot of talk, Doug, at this conference uh, about you know, the CIOs, how CIOs are transforming. What, do you, what are you seeing uh, from the CIOs? Are we finally at the point where CIOs are going to lead the charge to, to value production? We've heard that for, for decades. Uh, are we there now? Well, I think CIOs were always in value type of production. I think what they were, though, that they were the stop sign. They, they, they were uh, the enemy of the end user. I think the CIOs of the future, in order to survive, they have to be enablers. They have to get in front of the parade. They have to be the best friend of the end users and try to build flexible type of systems, whether it be infrastructure or software systems, that in many ways obviate the need for the CIO. Why have that layer if you've got a provider and a user and a corporation that can communicate with one another? So I think CIOs more and more, and I see it maybe for this year for the first time, are not thinking that this is a fad, that this is actually a trend that they better get in front of. So Doug, things are feeling a little frothy around the, around the valley. Big investments, big numbers. Um, what's kind of your take on the current, current state? Yeah, I think that my take is we are in a high price, I don't want to call it a bubble, a period of time. Now, price, the, the, the prices have adjusted. Now, I'm not making any comment as to the earnings announcement of any of our public companies, although I can tell you that business is very good both across our enterprise and consumer companies. And if you heard what I said about our SaaS companies being in the first inning, we have a long way to go. So do I think that SaaS companies should trade at 30 times revenues? Probably not. 
But I do think that given the runway that these companies have, and given the business model of recurring revenues, higher prices that maybe are awarded into an on-prem software companies are in order. And I actually think that the price adjustment that we've seen over the last few weeks is quite healthy because gone are the tourists, gone are the people that come in and want to do the pre-IPO rounds. And here we go, go again with the investors, I think, of, of substance, the investors that are in there for the very long term. I agree, I think it's a good, healthy pullback. It's kind of interesting to me to observe companies like ServiceNow, Splunk, Tableau, Workday, they, they seem to be trading together, completely different companies, different business, business models. Companies like you know, Tableau, really not even SaaS, uh, yet they sort of trade you know, with those other SaaS companies. As they pull back, do private companies um, reset their expectations or do they stay lofty? Well, it's a funny thing, you know, uh, private company CEOs are interesting. If the market goes up, at 10 a.m. in the morning, by 1 p.m., the prices go up in a private company. If the market drives like 500 points at 10 a.m., it's as if nothing happened. And so I think there's latency on down pricing and there's speed of light immediacy on up pricing. It's, uh, it's an interesting algorithm, isn't it? All right, Doug, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thanks very much for coming Thank back you. to theCUBE. It's always Thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. All Thank right, you. keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back Thank with our you. next guest. This is theCUBE. Thank you.